I was going to say that uh, all of the artists that we've talked to, that we've interviewed now, and we have, of course, clips mm -hmm. of their interviews from them that'll be in the film, they all, to a person, said that it was a first-class event and that they really appreciated what you did. And uh, Well, Pete Ellis really deserves the credit, and his team, a lot of other people. A lot of people worked to make that a first-class event because we didn't want to be <coughs> sloppy and have things that weren't covered and not overturned and... The artists were taken care of very well. We had a great lot of, lot of room backstage and everything. We weren't in a facility that had been built with walls and ceilings, you know, to constrain a certain type of event because that always constricts you. We were just out in kind of like the open, a huge park, you know, with a big lake there. So we had a lot of room and um, I'm glad the artists felt good about it. The important thing to me was that the people who attended, who paid money and attended, feel good at the end. And the next post would be, I guess, that the artists and the producers feel good. Well, that's definitely, uh, you know, 30, here we are 30 years later and people are still talking about it. So obviously you did something incredible. Tell us a little bit about, um, in the beginning, you know, in, there's a Bill Graham interview that we saw from then. And he was talking about the fact that he just came off the Rolling Stones tour and they were building the stage in the back. And he was saying it was a little rough going, just integrating the Unison team with the Bill Graham team. Tell us a little bit about what was going on behind that, how you got that you know, moving forward together. Yeah, I know that there was friction between Bill Graham team and the Unison team, but I can't really tell you much about it. I wasn't involved. I wasn't really running the Unison. I hadn't done the planning work. I actually was a student for a year at college while it was being planned. <coughs> and um, and as far as, as Bill Graham's side, you know, and I so how they interacted was kind of like out of my regard. My regard was let's try to work together and just, you know, hey, even if you don't agree, just let let the other side have some things and they'll let us have some things and you know and and you know, there was a lot of friction as to who knows how to do this business we were doing something very different than it's normally done we weren't coming from the existing business uh, of music production and you know normal producers and 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 promoters and all that so we were kind of coming from almost the mainstream direction here was bill graham coming from the heavy duty music direction so i'm looking back i'm not surprised at the conflict and I'm wondering, you know, uh, obviously at the time you went back to college, uh, it was after your crash, right? And uh, so you're probably having, you know, thoughts about your mortality and life in general and what you want to do with your life. You had all this money, Apple went public. Um, what did Apple and or Steve Jobs think about this when you, pre did you present this idea to them or say, hey, what do you think? Uh, you want to be involved or did you just do it straightforward and they yeah. didn't, they'd never comment? Yeah. First of all, although I'd had a plane crash that led to my being able to take off from Apple and go back to college and get my degree, something I really wanted to do, I didn't have a plane crash because I had my memory jolted so hard I have no memories of a crash or the next five weeks after. I have no anxieties getting in a plane again. I don't think, oh my gosh, I've got to do some. I did not have any thoughts about life. I've never had any um, oh mortality type thinking ever. I did not, and I did not approach anybody at Apple about these ideas. It was just all independent on my own. Um, it's like uh, here we had Apple and I'd had a divorce and, and I had an awful lot of money that I really didn't need or ever want. I didn't even pursue. When we started Apple, I had no ideas at all. Those stories are well known that I had no ideas to pursue, you know, bucks and do a company for that reason. I just wanted to be a good designer. So, so when we started um, um, the US Festival, well, I don't know what I was leading into. Well, I was, I was kind of asking about if, did you ever go to Steve Jobs and go, hey, Steve, no. we're going to do this and Apple should be involved and maybe they want, you know, you did the tech fair and maybe Apple okay. should be involved and put their products and market themselves. I mean, did that ever come up or was it just... No, I did this totally on my own. I never called people at Apple. I never called Steve Jobs. Um, of course, we did, Apple did present in the booth. They did, so the Apple promotions did get contacted, but they would have been contacted by our staff. And really, you know, I was a serious student that whole year. So I wasn't involved in the setting up very many hours total. I loved coming to my little office in uh, San Jose, you know, on Sundays and sit down. And There's actually a funny uh, interview that you did where you were uh, saying that actually Atari had a bigger booth in the tech fair than Apple did. Yeah, I don't, I don't doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, okay, so obviously uh, you had this incredible stage and sound system and amphitheater that you built. I mean, you spent exorbitant, you bought, Carlos told me stories, you bought property to, you know, if they didn't want to provide something you needed, you just bought the property and all that. Tell us a little bit about all the, that, mm -hmm. was that your uh, thinking that it had to be state-of-the-art sound and state-of-the-art stage and all of these things that came together 
because it was revolutionary yeah. at the time. Um, it would have been a lot in, in conjunction with my thinking, and maybe it was presented to me, and I said, yes, we, this is how we should do it. But really, it was um, the size of this show, the number of people that we were anticipating was so huge. I mean, we spent about $10 million just grooming land into an amphitheater that would sort of have decent viewability and usability for the event. Um, we did, so this event had so many people, it deserved decent sound. I mean, I don't like to go to concerts and you can't hear things well. And that meant secondary sets of speakers out into the audience. The first time ever a huge Diamond Vision video screen was at a concert in the United States. Um, and that went along with something else, which was our space bridge, which was very important. And I'm sure we'll get to that, but no, yeah, quality of the presentation and how it sounded everywhere was extremely important to me. But still, it was more just a gathering of, of an awful lot of people, you know, to share stories with themselves, meet other people. That was just as important as the quality of the music. So what did you think when you first showed up? You know, obviously you were away for a while. And then you, when you first showed up back there and saw the culmination of what your money was putting on, I mean, tell me what you felt when you first saw the stage and heard the sound and... Oh my God! Yeah, I was just—I was just so, um, so overjoyed. I mean, I, and I'd go out there and listen to sound checks and look at the stage. I'd sit in the house. Uh, we rented a house up on the hill, the one house that sort of had a view of the whole site, and I could look down on it. And uh, of course, you know, little is known. I had my first child the night before the show, so it's kind of like my wife went into labor. We borrowed some keys and drove a car to Culver City to a natural birth center and and you know, had a baby and came back. I opened the show with less than a day old baby in my hands. So I was so tired that I was missing an awful lot of the actual details going on at the start of the show. And my interviews, I look back at them and they looked like they were very clumsy and I was just overly tired. I was getting so little sleep. I'd have to sleep sometimes in the day during part of the music just to, just to get by. So you had a house up on the hill and uh, I, I heard that you had had like cable uh, television you know, so you had an actual live link to your television. Yes, up yes, and it wasn't my idea. I didn't come out and say, I've got to have a, a live feed of the show. But people like Peter Ellis were being so kind to me and knowing that I probably like things, you know, first class. And they, they, they ran a link up so I could all watch the show right there in the house in the bedroom. So let's talk about uh, some of the, the bands. And uh, did, did you have any, in 82, I know in 83 you had all this kind of stuff going on with Van Halen and The Clash. Uh, was there a lot of problems in negotiating the deal? Do you remember with the bands or what you're paying them? Uh, oh, in, in 82, I don't remember specifically. I uh, was going through Bill Graham. Uh, it was, they were exclusives. And we did have, um, gosh darn, I don't know how we, we wound up with uh, low video rights in 82. Um, you know, it, it's hard to go back that many years and remember it all. I'm probably not the best person to give you the best answers either. Um, as far as which type groups we had, of the sort of groups that I liked, the kind I liked, we only had one of them in the end. <laughs> Jerry Jeff Walker came on right after the Grateful Dead, opened Breakfast with the Dead. You know, what a great opening. So uh, that was day three, perhaps, your favorite, because it had Jackson Brown, <coughs> had Grateful Dead, Jerry Jeff Walker. It was a little more skewed Fleetwood Mac. Fleetwood Mac. Country that, um, that you... Yeah, and I, I actually, um, I, I wouldn't say I had any one day which was my favorite. The modern rock groups, I mean, every kind of music strikes me very deeply. Every day we had such good groups, um, it just really hardly matters at all. Day three, though, you know, I did wind up getting pretty close to Fleetwood Mac and the members of that group and had a good time with Jackson Brown and others. I like that kind of music. My life grew up with a lot of that music. But remember, as I started, my starting idea for putting on the Sus Festival was closer to, you know, the sort of stuff Jerry Jeff Walker sings. You, uh, in one of your interviews from back then, you had this term, which I thought was interesting. You, you said, called them the keyboard kids, you know, that the new generation is kind of the keyboard kids. And uh, just tell us a little bit about how you think that that was then and then how mm -hmm. it is now. At that point in time, 1982, uh, very few young people had their own computers. Very few people who went to college had their own computer to do college work. I was very rare when I went back to Berkeley to finish my degree that I could actually run my Pascal programs on my own Apple II computer in my, in my apartment rather than going down to the university terminals. So, um, so it was still kind of like, let's, this technology fair that was on the side, let's show the public, the attendees, a lot of what's going on in the technology world. 
you know, give them a chance to see it firsthand, try things out, and get inspired, especially where technology and music um, crossed over. Do you think that that was really successful? That uh, did you get down to the tech tents and see the? Oh yeah. And oh, I went through the tech tents for quite a long time, and um, I saw yeah, it was well attended, and they were um, very successful. It was very hot weather, and the tech tents were actually air conditioned too. But you feel that the what you were trying to accomplish that you really inspired some people, and people were getting turned on to these things. Probably seen them I for have, the first time. I have. I yeah, I've, I've actually had email in subsequent times from people who said that was they discovered so much of this technology and a certain keyboard, some instruments, and what the computer could do, and it turned them on to either computers or computers for their music. Yeah, I, I know people were inspired by that. In in this interview that we saw of you then. You, you were talking about something that you said you had four measures of success that, uh, I don't know if you remember this or if you still live by this rule now. Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure pretty much. And could you tell us what those four measures are, if you remember them? <coughs> I don't know about success, happiness. <coughs> four measures of happiness, I would say. I would, I would have to go back to think out exactly what they were. One of them is being truthful. Truth is the apex of all good is the way I, I like to say it now. And that means, um, and be open. And even if you're going to do something kind of wrong, be willing to talk about it. It's more important to be truthful than to be perfectly right in your life. Another is know inside that you're good, your ideas are good, even if other people don't agree with them. And um, number two is uh, seek for excellence. Try to be the best you can at whatever you're doing. And number four might be um, always have a light sense of humor about it. I'm not sure if those are the, the right four. You did. You said smile as you said that. Yeah. Before. Okay. The, the people smile. And well, I also had happiness equals show. smiles minus frowns. Uh, how you go through life? Do you smile more than you frown? And um, that's really the biggest guide to whether you had a happy, a good life or not. Not how much money you made or things like that. Well, that that kind of. And then after the US festival, I sort of changed the formula to happiness equals F cubed. Food means the necessary things in life. That's the first F. Fun is things like us festivals. Entertainment. Once we have enough of food, you know, entertainment is a valid thing to do in life. Because there were some people that were sort of intimating that you did all this great useful stuff with computers. And what does a rock concert have to do with anything you can define as useful in life? It's not considered productive. But entertainment's a part of our life. And friendship. Other people is the third F. And when I told that story to my high school being put into their Hall of Fame, the kids started laughing. And I said, oh, there might be a fourth F. <laughs> so when we interviewed Andy Hertzfeld, Andy was telling us this great thing that, you know, he, he said it was, you know, you had a, a specific passion and love for like the Apple II. And he felt that it was your... Uh, love and passion, uh, you know, that you put into the US Festival, why it became so incredible in the way it was, which is the same reason why Apple became such an incredible company and products. Do, you know, do you kind of agree mm -hmm. with us? Absolutely. Well, Andy, Andy knows me very well. And what he says, and he's a very smart person too. And, um, and so that's really, very often, I can even look at other good friends like Andy and see them recognizing things that you don't think about yourself consciously and personally. But he's absolutely right. And, and in fact, he was saying that, you know, you were a little bit different than, than the usual kid because he knew you since you were kids, right? And, no. Or was it teenagers no. perhaps? Or? No, since after Apple days. Okay. Um, um, he, was in, he was in a computer fair, a computer club in San Francisco after Apple started is when okay. we met. But he, he said that you would have Beatles posters on your wall and maybe, uh, you know, this, that, and the other that every natural teenager would have. But he said you would also have a poster of a data general Nova. Absolutely. I absolutely did. I had posters of, of I had yeah, pictures of a lot of computers I kept near me, and I had posters that actually, two different posters of the Data General Nova 4K Nova computer. Yeah. So, um, the one thing that I was curious about is, uh, in your interview then, you said, nope, this is a one-time shot. You know, we're doing this, we're going to do this as a one-time shot. Um why did you decide to come back and try it again for the 83 show? Um, actually, it was set up to be profitable, assuming, well, maybe I'd break even, but I didn't think I'd lose a huge amount of money, which I did. And then I called in a big eight accounting firm to audit and figure out why we lost money. And in their report, their report was full of all this stuff. We lost money because people were sneaking in for free. And we didn't have any valid counts. The press had said a certain number of people were there. Our ticket sales weren't that high. 
What was the difference? Who was right? We didn't have any tickets accumulated. We didn't have any counters rolling people in. We didn't have any aerial photography to count the crowd. So I thought, oh my gosh, well then what we'll do is the second year, we'll just tighten it up so people don't sneak in. And we'll absolutely, with that number of people, and we're going to increase it, we're going to have better groups, we're going to have a bigger attendance the second year, we'll actually absolutely guarantee we'll make money. And um, the second year we did have ticket counts, we had turnstiles that counted people, we had aerial photography, and they all coincided perfectly, and our numbers were right and the press numbers were wrong as to attendance. And we lost money um, again. So, hey, if you're losing money, I just took this attitude that as good of, as good as it might be for people, it's not the right product. You have to find the right product at a price that makes you money or you have hit on the wrong formula. So the people who are putting on concerts in big, huge, you know, stadiums and um, racetracks in Texas and California places, well, they had found a formula that was economically right. So if, if it would have... Uh, if you would have found that formula, do you think you would have kept it going, or was it just oh, I would have, I would have considered, I would have considered it, but you know, two years was no, it wasn't exhausting at all. It was just, hey, it wasn't the formula that would um, make money. Meaning, I wasn't supplying the product that people really want. If you supply the product they really want, like an Apple computer, you make money. I mean, you can judge it by that. So I was just sort of giving a gift, and that wasn't going to keep going on. Well, we talked a little bit about this thing with Russia, and uh, w was that your idea to, to do the, the, the bridge with Russia? The, the, the bridge with, space bridge with Russia was not my idea at all. I was the key person who had to say yes and approve it. I loved the idea from the time I heard it because it was a, bit, a little bit revolutionary, a little bit anti-government propaganda. It was a little bit, let's talk to the enemy and cooperate, which is the whole idea of unison, unite us in song. We're one people, we've got to unite. And could we pull this off? It would be a technology coup nobody had ever done. I love to do things first, especially when they're in technology. So being able to have a video transmission to Moscow, a transmission back, this was the Cold War. This wasn't even perestroika. I mean, we weren't even close. They were like Al-Qaeda back then, the Russians. So this was very um, kind of exciting, thrilling, and we didn't know if we could even pull it off technically. They didn't have the satellite equipment except that the, the U.S. had pulled out of an Olympics and NBC left their equipment in a warehouse in Moscow. So could that equipment be pulled out by some technical people, constructed, hooked up with a satellite, and make the connection? We had to even arrange for phone calls to do settings and make sure things were working. We had to arrange, we got a special phone line set up from the president of GTE because you couldn't make phone calls to Russia in those days without, you know, reserving a call like two weeks ahead. Oh, no, it was a very, very difficult, risky technology thing. Could we ever pull it off? The instant the Russian video came onto our screen, I was backstage, I couldn't believe it. I didn't expect we'd actually accomplish it. I didn't think we'd actually technically get it to work. And there it was working, and I just got this huge shiver. Uh, we had accomplished something that's one of those things that's not supposed to be, that probably shouldn't have even been possible. Okay. Here, so. <coughs>